Chris, I will turn it over to you. Thank you and welcome. Great. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, thank you very much, MSBA. I always appreciate the opportunity to talk about issues at the nexus of technology and legal. Um, I've been living there for about 20 years now. Um, I started Shepherd Data. Oh my goodness. Um, I think it was, I think it's almost 20 years. I think it's 19 years. Um, and we have been doing e-discovery. Yes, even way back then. Um, and we have certainly expanded out. We have gotten into computer forensics, everything else. But I've always had um, one foot in both worlds. I consider myself a translator um, between technology and legal. Different languages, folks, as you probably have found out. So welcome, welcome. Um, I miss seeing all of you. I really enjoy having the live audience. This is kind of strange to me. It's like uh, being a comedian without hearing the laughter. So that has been hard for me. But I really love seeing how we have been so creative in responding to the difficulties in our current situation. And I really hate that I didn't invest into Zoom when I could have, darn. <laughs> so anyhow, I also want to do a shout out to Joy Solomon and Laura Elwood. They are assisting me. They are both from Shepherd Data. Um, they are helping me with kind of the technology behind the scenes. Today, I'm kind of stepping back and I'm just being the talking head and doing the presentation. Um, as Jennifer mentioned, um, please enter your questions into chat. We are fielding those and we're gonna answer those at the end. I've got a full hour scheduled. So if we have time, we will get to them. If we do not, we'll respond either through email or some other means. If you have technical issues, MSBA is monitoring and someone from MSBA will reach out to you. So I'm not looking, so they will be watching. So let's get started. So the format of the presentation, I am highlighting essentially five roles. You know, I was trying to do the rule of three and I just couldn't quite narrow it down. And frankly, I wanted to do 10 roles, but eventually I just decided upon these five roles. And yes, I know folks, I'm sure some of you who are very um, like order, these are not in order. I'm sorry, I know it will irritate some of you, but the reason why they're not in order is because what I'm doing is I'm following the electronic discovery reference model, or often that's called the EDRM. So the EDRM, electronic discovery reference model, is something that we all refer to. I'll be showing you that in a little bit, but just that's why the rules are ordered the way they are. Also, Starting out with the model rules, I'm going to show you the model rule. And then there's one that has a difference in the Minnesota court rules or in the professional rules. So, and it's kind of an important difference. It's a critical difference. So I will be pointing that one out to you. Also during the presentation, I'll be referring to some case law. Now I'm just doing some. And like I said, I've been doing e-discovery for about 20 years. And I'm going to point out some of my favorite cases that I like. They may not necessarily be the most current cases, but they certainly illustrate my points. So just so you know, that's what's going on. So let's get into it. Rule 1.1, everyone knows this one, competent representation. So we know this. What we may not know about is this comment eight. So what does that mean, stay abreast of changes in the law and its practice, including the benefits and risks associated with relevant technology? Well, what the heck is rel relevant technology? So let's talk about that. And I'm gonna talk about four categories of relevant technology. Now, I gotta tell you, attorneys don't like technology. Some do, but in my experience, it's like a different language. And oftentimes what happens is the attorneys will say, hey, let's send that problem to the tech person. He or she will figure out how to get it done. And every law firm has that tech person. I'm sure all of you there in law firms have a tech person that you go to. That, you know, when your computer doesn't turn on, it's like, oh my God, I'm gonna call, you know, Jerry and Jerry's gonna help me. Now that's great, I love tech people. You know, I consider myself a pseudo tech person. You know, I, I help people turn on their computers, you know, hook up the printers, things like that. But
But what I got to tell you is that these tech people are wonderful people, but they're not trained on preserving data. They will get the job done. They're trained on making you happy in the instant minute that you're unhappy. So they will be responsive and they will get it done. But in my experience, what happens when they get into the forensics, computer forensics and e-discovery, they kind of start making errors. And it's not intentional, of course not. So for example, I have seen this happen more than once. You have the tech person and attorney will ask them, oh, please search for this keyword in Outlook. You know, seems simple. I'm sure some of you have even asked that. And maybe it went okay. But the problem is, it really depends on how they search for it and how they pull that data out. So basically, in Outlook or email system, there's an email metadata. So, and metadata is data about me data. So what will happen when the tech person searches this, they have a potential of changing that metadata. And particularly if they pull out that email from the store, all of that information gets uh, changed. So what happens, and I'm gonna say this word because I practiced it for a year, spoliation. Spoliation is when the data somehow gets corrupted. So these tech guys often do this, seen it many, many times. So the point of this presentation is to give you a heads up and to say, think about, gosh, you know, this tech guy, they're great, but maybe they don't know. Another thing to think about, what's this tech person gonna look like on the stand? In my experience, tech people don't like to be on the stand. They're mostly, you know, kind of quiet people. They get the job done and it might be a little intimidating for them to get in front of a judge and jury. So you need to think about that. So I'm, we're gonna delve into the e-discovery world. We're gonna talk about where I see, where we've seen some ethic problems. A couple of quotes for you. Um, you really do need to know e-discovery as you know the rules of civil procedure. And you know, frankly, I love this quote. Why are the greatest quotes in footnotes? I don't know why that is, but I have a lot of footnote quotes. Um, so yeah, you know, e-discovery is a little scary. Um, I did edit this, I added COVID-19, you know, sign of the times. <laughs> but, you know, it's something that you can learn. You're all very smart people. So this is the start. For some of you, I'm sure you're experts, so this is a refresher, you're just hanging out because you, e you need the ethics credit. That's cool. I'm gonna show you some new stuff too. But the main thing is don't freak out. There's a lot of resources out there. You're gonna do just fine. So let's talk about the scope. I kind of talked about that. Remember, we talked about relevant technology. So the scope includes your IT, your client's IT, the case's IT, as well as electronic data law. So starting with your IT. So there was an audit done a few years ago, and it was simple. It was basically the IT that you use on a daily basis. And include formatting a motion in Word, bait stamping a PDF, and extracting information from Excel spreadsheet. Pretty simple, right? So in this audit of law firms, what was shown is that these tasks normally take 30 minutes. It was taking law firms at least five hours to do these basic tasks. So the moral of this is maybe law firms aren't designed to do IT. <laughs> maybe they're the ones that shouldn't be working on some of these things and they should think about or outsourcing this or educating themselves on how to do some of these basic things. This is just basic stuff. I'm not even talking about the difficult e-discovery stuff. So then what about your client's IT? Let's take it to another level. So this is an excerpt about what judges think that you should understand. So you need to understand your client's preservation strategy because we need to prevent spoliation. So that is like number one on the judge's list that you need to understand that. And it doesn't have to be in depth. You know, you can take along a co colleague that speaks IT if you don't, that's okay. You know, I'm available. You want to give me a call? I'll come along and help. I'll translate for you. Um, and, but really, that's where you need to start. 
Also, interesting enough, look at the bottom one, client's IT infrastructure. So the judges really don't expect you to like know that in depth. I mean, you know, some of this infrastructure is unbelievably complex, but you need to kind of have an understanding of it. And they expect you to have someone that speaks geek. So it's an interesting thought. Now, you also need to understand the cases IT. So it could happen where you have a piece of technology that's important to the case. So I love this case. So Jenna Lauer was a key witness in the George Zimmerman trial. Well, as you recall, Zimmerman's brother was doing these massive tweets about the trial the whole time. Jenna followed him. So this is what that screen, this screenshot shows. It shows that she was actually following him and she's logged in. So this came to trial and she was up on the stand. So the prior at trial, she denied that she was following Robert Zimmerman. So the prosecutor tried to question her about it and asked about her Twitter account. And she said, no, no, I'm not following it. So the prosecutor has a computer, brings up her Twitter account, and it looks weird. <laughs> it doesn't make sense because they forgot one key step. They forgot to log in as her. So it did not show that she was following anybody. So what happened is the prosecutor kind of goes, hmm, this is weird. This doesn't look like what we, what we practice. And Jenna's like, well, I don't know. <laughs> you tell me. You're the one that's asking me about this. And the attorney says, well, I don't know Twitter. Okay, massive fail. So you need to know about the case IT as well. And also, the de the, actually, the case law. So if you don't know, the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure have been amended. They will, they will continue to be amended. There were some major edits, if you will, um, in 20, uh, 2006 and 2015. So in this particular case in Fulton, the attorney cited outdated case law. Yeah he actually relied upon the wrong standard. So, you know, the judge kind of caught that. <laughs> and, you know, I don't know actually if the judge caught it or opposing counsel caught it. They may have both. I think it was the judge though. Um, but anyhow, he got sanctions. Uh, so essentially he had to pay opposing parties fees and costs of the motion to compel. Um, plus the court required him to show his quote, offending, unquote, brief, to members, senior members of his law firm. I mean, that is almost worse than the fees, you know, because it's really embarrassing. It's like, here, huh, I screwed up. Um, then, plus, as part of a sanction, for five years after this decision, if another court threatened or imposed a sanction, he had to immediately disclose that he screwed up the first time. And then he established that he screwed up twice and then that current judge could decide what to do. Not so great. So know your case law. All right, let's move on to rule 3.4, protect and produce evidence. Okay, basic stuff, we all know this. But how does that get screwed up in e-discovery? Let's talk about first. So a couple of things we need to do as foundation, uh, there's two, Federal Rules of Civil Procedure involved here, 26 and 37, I'll be showing you those. Again, we're gonna go into a little bit more depth on the EDRM, I'm gonna show you that. Uh, we're gonna talk about your client's infrastructure, and we're gonna talk about litigation hold as well as metadata. So this is Rule 26. Now, I put this view up because I wanted to show you what was there before. Uh, and this is really where attorney Ryan screwed up. Um, the standard used to be if the discovery appears reasonably calculated to lead to the discovery of admissible evidence. So that is in that kind of marked out language. And I, I think I'm sure some of you remember that standard that has changed. That is now that new language that's underscored. It's more of a balancing factor. So in um, 
So that's the new standard. And Rule 37, Rule 37E is brand new. Um, now, this applies when lost electronics, electronically stored information. Now, you can see that actually in the rule. See that E, it says electronically stored information. Often that's referred to as ESI. So sometimes I'll lapse into geek speak, but that's one of the ones I use, ESI. It just stands for electronically stored information. So now you have this kind of checklist that you have to go through if, if, if it, excuse me, you know what, I gotta tell you, I am not a morning person. I am actually impressed that I can even talk. <laughs> Generally, I don't even take appointments until 10 o'clock. So you are witnessing a miracle here because I am jazzed up on caffeine. And if this runs out, we're in serious trouble. <laughs> but anyhow, so basically you're looking at, it should have been preserved. Now that's pulling in common law precedent. Now before this, there was like a really cool safe harbor rule. And essentially what happened is if you had a great system for deleting information, you could say, hey, we have a great system for del deleting information and we follow this. Well, in practice, it didn't really work out so great because people started doing routine destruction after two weeks. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you know, we deleted all that information pertaining to the class because to the case because it was part of the routine destruction. So yeah, there was a lot of spoliation happening. So they did revise this. And so now they kind of have this factoring and the stepped process, which is kind of cool. So here it is, the electronic discovery reference model or what we call the EDRM. Now, the reason why I'm showing you this is because this is essentially a diagram of how electronic evidence passes through the system. Now, I am using a simplified model of this. Um, um, this is probably one of the more original ones. And the EDRM, it's actually, you can go to a website. It's an organization. It has a bit of history. Um, it was originally founded by Tom Gelman and George Sosha. Um, and then it was, uh, it moved to Duke Law. And now currently, Mary Mack and Kaylee Wildstead are heading it up. They bought it and they are doing amazing things with it. So you see that little website, edrnnet.net? Go there. Really, seriously. Go there. Check it out. They do have an updated model. You'll see that information governance is a lot more expansive. And they kind of changed the phrasing, they made it more modern. I like this one um, because it's just so simple um, and it's great for this presentation, but you really need to see the new one. So, and we're just gonna kind of go over this. So essentially what happens with electronic evidence is that it starts in the information governance and then it moves as the case pro progresses, as it moves through, it goes through these different stages. So you'll have identification and preservation. So you just kind of move through the graph. And you can see at the bottom, at first the amount of data, there's a large amount, but as you move through the process, the volume goes down and the relevance of the key documents goes up. We all know this. We all know that you always start out with lots of information, but then at trial you have five documents because they are the most critical and relevant uh, information. So that is the EDRM. I'm going to be coming back to that, but I want you to get in your head, you know, kind of this graph of how evidence is moving through the system. Okay, case law, I'm gonna give you this one. You didn't have to do some research. This is very relevant. If you're in Minnesota and you're in federal court, look it up. Um, Paisley Park, yes, it's about Prince, um, it's about um, what happened. Um, essentially, it's a spoliation case. I'm using it again. And this is where, remember we were talking about Rule 37? So the court actually used that analysis and granted monetary sanctions. The reason why? Because one of the defendants committed spoliation with his iPhone, a couple of iPhones actually. So what he did, is that he failed to stop his auto delete 
Now, it was unclear to me whether he failed to stop it or whether it was just something he actively did, but definitely he didn't do anything to stop the auto delete. That's a problem because it's deleting old information. Well, then he took it a step further. There is case law out there that says if you fail to stop auto delete, you might be okay. It really depends on your intent. And that's the hardest thing. You have to improve intent here. You know, did they intend to delete that data? So he did auto delete, well then he took it further. He wiped the phone. <laughs> so, you know, most people don't necessarily wipe their phones. You know, they might do it if they're getting a new phone, but just to randomly do it, eh, I don't know. Some people don't even know how to do that. He figured it out. And then he took it a step further. He discarded the phones. So the court found um, intent and using that Rule 37 analysis, granted monetary sanctions. Read it. It's in our district. Read it, read it, read it. It's a great, great case too. I was so relieved when it came out because we didn't have good precedent. We do now. So um, that's kind of the foundation here on um, the Rule 37. So let's talk about where attorneys have gotten into trouble. So it's not good to conceal evidence. So, and you know, it's a problem when your client conceals evidence on how you do that. So for ethics, the attorney is vulnerable if he or she does nothing and lets the concealment continue or fails to take steps to preserve the evidence or frankly is not active in collecting the evidence. I mean, you just can't say to your client, oh, here, go do that. You know, preserve stuff, see ya, good luck with that. Um, no, you can't do that. So what you do is you need to be actively involved. Qualcomm is a great case illustrating what can go wrong. So there was actually two sets of attorneys and some of you have the situation right now. You're working with your either corporate inside counsel or your outside counsel. So, and ideally, you're supposed to work together. So what happened in Qualcomm is after the trial, they found 300,000 pages of emails and other documents that just weren't produced. <laughs> and they should have been. So what happened is that the court found during the discovery phase, phase that no attorney, not inside or outside counsel, explained the legal issues to the appropriate employees or they didn't even discuss the collection procedures. No one talked to the employees about it. I'm not sure how they even got anything. Um, also, no one bothered to talk to IT and discuss what are the relevant uh, computer systems. You know, they didn't try to find the geek guy. They didn't care. They just didn't do it. And finally, and actually there was a lot, I just did, selected three things. Um, no attorney supervised any e-discovery collection. So it was a problem. So what happened ultimately, uh, Qualcomm was ordered to pay opposing parties defense costs. Um, 8.5 million um, and initially outside counsel was sanctioned and referred to the bar for disciplinary action. But then, of course, through a series of he uh, hearings and appeals, the sanctions were vacated. So essentially what was found is that the Qualcomm employees and inside counsel misled outside counsel, but it was close. <laughs> it was really close. So, you know, the moral of the story on this one is that you need to really have control of your e-discovery because it can go south. You know, often what happens is that you, have, you don't have any oversight, so miscommunication happens, and this is where you get into problems. Now, the second case was clearly the attorney. He did not disclose an email server. And of course, Rule 37 sanctions, unquestionable. Take a look at those cases. And again, there's probably more current case law, so make sure you check that out. But these, I love these cases. Clean up your Facebook. Okay, what happened here? It's about Isaiah Lester's Facebook page. 
So on his Facebook page, and I'm sure you have seen all these, um, he was holding a beer can and wearing a t-shirt. Now think of all the bad t-shirts you've seen. Just think about it. I'm not going to tell you what was on it because I can't, frankly, I don't, I think they beat me out. <laughs> I think, you know, we'd get, we'd get fined if I said what was on this t-shirt. So anyhow, this t-shirt was one of those bad t-shirts that you've seen. So, you know, as Aya goes into his attorney and says, um, yeah, you know, I have Facebook and the attorney sees that and says, you know what? There is no way you can keep that Facebook picture, Facebook page. You got to clean up your Facebook now. All I need is to have a big blow up of you presented in front of the jury with that t-shirt. So what it was, was wrongful death action of his wife. And it was a derogatory thing about women on his t-shirt. So that was a problem. So the attorney advised him to spoliate the evidence. Well, so, you know, <laughs> this kind of came out. Um, and essentially during uh, the trial, um, there were some sanctions. Um, the court trial gave two adverse inferences instructions to the jury. And it's kind of funny. One, while Lester was actually testifying and presuming that those photographs that were deleted were harmful to his case. Um, evidently, he uh, deleted more than just that one. The one they found was the most damning one, actually. Um, and even with that, even with those adverse inferences, the jury did award an $8.58 um, $8 million verdict. Um, but the court sanctioned Lester and his attorney $722,000 for his, their misconduct. And that was divided up between the attorney Murray. Uh, Murray bared the brunt of it, $542,000, and Lester the rest. Uh, Lester the rest, and then also they had to cover some attorney's fees addressing the spoliation issue. Well, as these things go, they get legs. So then Murray, attorney Murray, faced disciplinary action from Virginia State Bar. Ultimately, he agreed to the charges against him. He agreed to engage, he agreed into engaging in dishonesty, fraud, deceit, and misrepresentation. His law a license was suspended for five years. He was an older gentleman and he effectively that that suspension effectively ended his career. So that's what can happen when you advise your client to destroy evidence. It's a problem. So really the moral here again is actively work with your clients on preserving electronic evidence. So this is a quote from this case, um, just kind of be, well, actually it's not from a case, it's a, um, uh, someone reviewing this case. Look at this case. Um, essentially, you need to work with your clients on the e-discovery process, um, and there's a lot of things that you need to do. <laughs> so this is just the start of the list. Um, this is an interesting case. Um, so what happened here is um, the attorney in the case um, was pursuing a class action suit and that did settle ultimately, that's great. But the attorney, Ms. Sklar, also sought $22 million in attorney's fees. Well, a to a Toshiba opposed her request. So she said, okay, I I can show you that I did this work. She produced PDF copies of her billing. And looking at these PDF copies as they were produced, it showed that she worked 16 hours per day, seven days a week for 22 months. I don't know about you, but I can't work like that. <laughs> and trust me, I have tried. So they're like, well, that doesn't really make sense. And she says, well, you know, I redacted these. I can give you more information. Um, you know, I, I can't give you the more information on this because it's attorney client. Well, they're like, well, you have to. And the judge ordered her to produce the underlying original documents. So when you make a PDF, that's not the, that's not the first document. Usually a PDF, 
can be from another document. It could be Excel files, it could be Word or whatever. And that's what happened here. So she had the original files, allegedly. So she said, well, you know, I don't have the original files because I have a, a system where it automatically deletes them. And then, so they're like, why did you delete those? You know, you need to preserve that. And she goes, oh, oh no, I, did, I didn't delete them. <laughs> so she's a little unclear on this. So um, what happened then is then they're like, well, okay, you didn't delete them. You know, computer forensics people can find all sorts of fun stuff. <laughs> We're going to order you, the court ordered her to a forensic, a computer forensic person to come out and collect her computer. So basically computer forensic people go out and they make an exact copy of whatever is on your computer and you can find out. So of course she had issues with that, but the judge says, no, you got to do this. So the day before the computer forensic examiner was coming out, she canceled it. And she said, I can't give it to you. You know, I've got attorney client, it's a problem. So she got fit, she got fined. So because court somewhat got upset, I don't know why, but they kind of got upset with her. So she did not get her fees. And instead she had monetary sanctions of over 160,000 levied against her. Um, again, as things go, um, she received disciplinary action from the California bar. She had 30 days suspension, one year suspended, and probation for two years. And Minnesota bar followed the California bar. So that is what happens if you don't know what native format means, if you don't know <laughs> your discovery. Um, you know, I was curious to see if she's still practicing. She did get reinstated. August 1st, 2019. I think she learned her lesson. Um, also, this is a test. There's a big typo here. Um, at the very bottom line, you see it is no loner, an excuse. You know, you are alone if you're committing e-discovery right now. If you're going forward with the e-discovery, you're on your own. If you start fighting this stuff, you shouldn't be fighting about e-discovery. You know, this is something that you need to know. And if you don't know it, you need to get someone who does. Duty of candor. Again, we've all read this, you know, don't lie. <laughs> don't lie, don't hide the evidence. So how do you do that in e discovery? Well, you know, there's a little tool in the rules, in the civil rules. You have these Rule 26 F conferences. And really here, you are disclosing what's going on. You don't want to have fights about e-discovery. It's, you know, it's what I, that's what I love about te technology. It's black and white. Either you have the evidence or you don't, and you need to disclose where that is. You need to get to the truth of the matter, and you don't play games with your e-discovery. Also, you can develop out ESI protocols, and ESI stands for Electronically Stored Information. So you work out with the other side what you're going to disclose and how you're going to disclose it, Again, there's lots of information on that. All you have to do is do a Google search, do ESI protocols, you will find them. But be candid. And frankly, if you can't figure it out, judges hate this, but they will interview you, go to the judge. I'm sure he or she will have information for you. Lots of times courts have standard ESI protocols. So, and really, what you need to do is go through it. Now, this is kind of old school. This is when, you know, we actually had actual servers, and this is actually a large server form. A lot of us have gone to the cloud. So it's pretty easy to say, hey, it's in Microsoft. But you can say, okay, these clients' information is in this folder. You know, really, and make sure that for sure it is in that folder. And be candid about it. Don't hide the evidence. Now, if you're having problems even finding the evidence or even getting it, bring your gee to court, as Judge Peck would say. Judge Peck has now retired. I miss seeing him. I miss seeing his decision. He is now a consultant. Um, and it's a big law firm, and I can't remember the name right now. I'm running out of coffee. So, <laughs> um, And then also, I love this quote, too. Uh, let the... Let the opposing parties confer and dance geek to geek. So it is okay if you need to bring your geek to court. 
You know, you think about who you're bringing. I don't know if you want to bring that IT person. You know, you might want to consider someone else, maybe a tech savvy attorney, or maybe, you know, an outside consultant, but let them speak geek and they can figure it out. There's nothing to hide here. You're not gonna hide your evidence. Okay, so this case, um, this is kind of a sad situation. Um, I actually found this case before George Floyd, but it, it's, um, it's just kind of reflects what's going on in our criminal justice system. So this was, the underlying case is a civil lawsuit bought by a prisoner because he was injured when he was forcibly removed from his cell. He was then shot in the face with a pepper ball gun and then beat up. Great. So this is a quote from the prisoner. I just want to tell you for the record, they shot me in the face three times and punched me in the head several times. I didn't resist. So after the incident, there was a video showing this guy's injuries. That video was not produced. Also, subsequent to the incident, as well as the video, there were emails talking about the video and that they had withheld that video and reasons why they withheld that video. Do you think that video is relevant? I don't know, maybe. I think the emails talking about that they were hiding the video were relevant? Yeah. So what happened is ultimately the attorneys got sanctions. I listed out the sanctions here. You can read those on your own. So that's kind of the problem. And also, just so you know, I will make um, this available, this presentation via PDF. I'm not going to give you the original. You don't want the original. I'm going to give you the PDF. Um, if you're really concerned about metadata, too bad. <laughs> you'll, get, you'll get the context here. <laughs> All right, let's move on. Rule 1.6, confidentiality obligations. So basically, you're not going to reveal your client's secret. Pretty easy. So you want to preserve that evidence. Okay, so that, again, how does that get messed up in e-discovery? Oh, and I almost forgot. So this is the little difference that Minnesota has. A loyal sh lawyer shall not knowingly. So that's huge because the model rule is pretty much a mandate. You shall not reveal. But Minnesota inserted knowingly. And I'll show you why that's important as we progress. So essentially with electronic evidence, what happens are three, uh, inadvertent disclosure happens all the time. We're gonna talk about, um, you know, when mistakes happen, what you can do, you can have a clawback, you can bring that evidence back. And then what I'm seeing a lot with inadvertent disclosure is a lack of security. Now, that is happening a lot. You're not hearing about it right now um, because of COVID, but a lot of people are working from home and a lot of people are vulnerable because we've got consumer grade protection with corporate information. So it's a problem. All right, inadvertent disclosure. I hope you've never experienced this. Unfortunately, I have. It's like, oh my God. I can't believe I sent that email. <laughs> oh my God. Or even worse, I just sent out our case strategy. It's in the documents that we just produced. Now, I actually haven't done that. Um, I have sent emails um, and I have felt that, but it happens. So one of the ones that you may have heard about was um, the tales of Angelina Torino. Um, she is with Bressler and Marie Rose. I think she's with, still with them, actually. Um, she was representing Wells Fargo, and she responded to a third-party subpoena in a case between two financial advisors that also happened to be brothers. So it's one of those messy family law things. So it seemed easy, but she actually produced documents without redaction or confidentiality designation. Yikes. They had agreement, but they had to be stamped. Well, also, she produced a lot more documents than what she thought she was doing. 
and it actually revealed billions of dollars of client account information. And it was from residents in numerous states and possibly Europe. <laughs> Whoopsie. <laughs> so, you know, that was bad enough at the other side, but then opposing counsel, now remember these documents weren't protected because they weren't stamped, took them to the New York Times, which of course subsequently published it. Yay. So yeah, ooh, big oopsie. And you, you know, when you read this, it's like, oh my God, how could she have done this? Well, I kind of thought about it. She was using relativity. Let me show you what relativity can do if you don't know what you're doing. So this is a screenshot of relativity. So on the left-hand side, as you're facing the screen, um, is basically a representation of the document. On the right-hand side is the, um, where you enter your information. So you can go through and you can check it, blah, 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 blah. Now you may see in the right-hand corner, my face might be there, so I'm just gonna blow that up. You see document one of 1,000, okay? So it looks like you have 1,000 documents to review. All right. <laughs> you know, in a big case, 1,000 documents, that's nothing. So great. So I'm gonna go through those 1,000 documents. And again, let me show you. So I am now, I've gone through, I've looked at them, I've marked them up, yay. Um, and I am done. So I'm at document 1000 of 1000, okay? And this is probably what she saw. Well, first of all, it's kind of unusual to have exactly 1000, you know, but it, it does happen. I mean, I, I'd say it does happen. But let me show you another screen. So now if you see, this is actually the full set that she was supposed to be reviewing or a representative thing of what could happen. So you can see we've got one of 1,000. So the way relativity works is that you get little batches and you review each batch. Somehow it just seems more workable. Instead of seeing that big number, 77,000, you just work with 1,000 sets. Well, for some reason she didn't go back to this or maybe she didn't have rights. It could have been a technology issue um, where someone didn't give her the appropriate rights but she actually had a lot more than just a thousand documents. So she did not review quite a bit of documents. She only reviewed the thousand documents of her set. So because that didn't have any markings, everyone just followed her orders and produced all these documents. So that's how that happened. It's a simple technology thing. It's when you don't understand what you're working with. Okay, let's even simplify it more because relativity is a little, a little complicated. So this is a screen show. This is like a PowerPoint presentation. It's one slide that I took from a presentation. These are my cats. You know, I have a thing about animals. Um, so anyhow, these are my cats. Um, yes, they're cute. Um, but there is more information here than just meets the eye. So if you were to do this where you just produce a PDF of this, this would be all you would see. You would just see this nice, cute little pictures of these cute little kitties. But then let's go into it. So now I'm showing you the underlying screenshot of what's also in this one document. It's PowerPoint. So you can see in the notes, I've got the whole Gettysburg address input in here. <laughs> So you hide information. Also, too, I have a second screen that normally wouldn't have gotten produced to PDF or printed. So it's a smoking gun. You can see that the two is scratched out. That means it's hidden, that you couldn't see it. You wouldn't produce it, but it's there. It's there. Also, let's go a little further. So let's go into the metadata. And you can see on the right-hand side, there's a lot of stuff in here. So the titles, blah, blah, blah tags, hot, hot, hot. And here is an example of how I stole information from the competitor. So you can actually move data back and forth. Um, I have seen attorney client stuff kind of embedded in here. So, you know, it's something that you need to be aware of. This is the metadata. This is the data about the data. It can come in lots of different forms. Also look at the related people. Look at the different people who touched this. All important information. This is all lost if you PDF this document and produce it. So oftentimes what will happen is they'll receive a PDF and they'll say, you know what, we need to see the metadata. And you'll say, 
oh, I don't know if I have that. <laughs> Hopefully now you'll keep that information. So, you know, what happens a lot is that um, the stuff does get out. So it is important for you to have a clawback agreement. And this is under the federal rule of evidence 502D. Judge Peck would say that you get this. <laughs> it's very important. So basically it's an agreement between the parties saying, hey, I screwed up, give me back my documents and don't use them. Now, sometimes, you know, that happens. If you don't have a clawback agreement in place, then you go to kind of an interplay between the federal rules of procedure and 502B. So basically you follow these steps, you have to prove certain things and you just walk through these steps to get the information back. Okay? So you can ask for it back. People make mistakes. Remember in Minnesota too, it's knowingly. Okay, five three, supervision. A lot of information, I hate lots of text on screen. Basically, you need to supervise people. <laughs> you need to make sure they're um, up to your standards. You can read the rule on your own. So this case law, JM Manufacturing, one of my favorites, again. Uh, so essentially what happened is they produced privileged information to opposing counsel. Um, opposing counsel says, hey, you produce privileged information. Are you sure you want to do that? Oopsie. No, we didn't want to do that. So they clawed it back. So they redid it. They produced the same privileged information again. Opposing counsel says, hey, uh, you did it again. Um, maybe you want us to see this. No, no, we don't. We don't want you to see this. So they take it back, we do it, everything else. And then again, they produce it one more time. Three times they did this. Lovely. So um, of course now the, the other side's like, yeah, well, you want us to see this. <laughs> so yeah, it did go to court. Basically what happened is the court said, hey, mistakes happen, but the more you do it, the more the court's gonna be inclined to say, no, you know what? <laughs> you're starting to show intent here. <laughs> so kind of be careful about that. Again, it's this good co quotes in a footnote. Be careful about relying upon computer analysis. Um, I found this a, f um, a few years ago um, on the left-hand side. That's how a computer sees language, frankly. When I look at it, it hurts my eyes. So what I did is I actually typed it out, what it's supposed to be. Um, this is, you know, if you spoke to a computer like this, it would have no problem understanding you, um, but obviously it's very wrong. So computers are great. They do a lot of wonderful things, but they're not human. They make mistakes, human mistakes, or actually computer mistakes. It's kind of interesting. <laughs> All right, I talked about this. This is another threat to evidence getting out are security threats. As I mentioned before, it is happening a lot right now. It's a problem. Um, <laughs> we're under attack, folks. It's, it's pretty bad. Um, so be aware. Um, I'm not sure exactly where the intent rises. I mean, obviously, if you just you know sit in the Starbucks, you don't have a VPN, and you're emailing your clients in an unsecured network, that could be a problem. Um, and now it is a problem because I told you about it. So um, be aware that you need to protect it. So if you have awareness that you're in an unsecured environment and you're still doing privileged information in that unsecured environment, that's a problem and you could get into trouble. Um, vendors are not exempt from this. Epic is a big corporation um, that's an e-discovery vendor. Um, actually, um, I admire them because they responded very quickly to this. Um, I thought they did a really good job. What they were, were a victim of ransomware. And I gotta tell you, this is a criminal thing. It's a criminal thing that someone is hacking in. You know, you could have as much security as you want, but these people are criminals. It is important though, to lock the door. Don't just let people in. So you need to take the minimum things to lock the doors. So, you know, the question is, do you have what it takes? 
So you need to keep your computer up to date. I'm not gonna read all these. You can read all these, but these are five basic things. So I just wanna pat, um, highlight that you should be using one password. Use really good passwords and don't use your name and birth date or your spouse's name and birth date or your cat's name and birth date. <laughs> Those are really easy to hack. Don't do that. I would say invest in one password. Um, that's one of my favorites. Um, I'm not being compensated for this in any means whatsoever. Um, but I just like it because it organizes all your passwords. Don't use the same password for every website. You know, it's pretty easy. I mean, it's easy to remember, but it's a real problem if you get hacked. So heads up on that. Two-factor authentication, if you're not aware, that's basically when you log into a secured website and then they send something to you. Um, normally it's like on your cell phone. They text message you and then you have to input that message. That's great. Do that. There has been some data breaches with that, so that will probably get timed up a little bit more, but it's good. Use it. Also use a VPN. Um, I've got nine areas of, um, as you walk through that e-discovery performance, remember we talked about the ESI? Here are some of the things that you kind of need to have a heads up on. This was promulgated by the State Bar of California. Yeah, I know it's California, but it's really good. Um, it's a nice overview of some of the things that you need to start thinking about. Um, so, and really, you need to watch your clients because they are crazy. Um, it is a very high stress situation for them. Um, their inclination is to try to hide their personal information. And, you know, I have seen some stuff on these cell phones. <laughs> I think I've seen it all. Um, and clients are like, oh my God, you know, this female forensic examiner is going to see this. Just tell them, you know, we've seen it all. We've seen it all. The only problem where they can run into problems if it's child pornography. I do have an obligation to report that. But all that other stuff, well, or if he's like actively plotting to kill someone, um, but all that other stuff, that's their stuff. And frankly, we're trained to, to kind of just bypass that. So it's worse if they try to clean it up because then you have evidence of spoliation and that's a problem. And forensic examiners go insane. Opposing, opposing forensic examiners go insane. And I have fought many of those and they are ugly. So don't destroy evidence. Tell your clients, it's okay. These people do this for a living. It's okay. It's not gonna get out. And if it get, does get out, we're gonna claw it back. So let's walk through the EDRM. I kind of wanna give you a heads up on some of the common things. <clears throat> that happen. So, um, you know, these things go off track. <laughs> so really where we see most of the issues um, when it gets to us is in the production phase, just like when I was showing you relativity. <clears throat> and FYI, heads up, I might go a little long here. They told me that I'm the only one speaking. So, you know, I'm tempted to talk all morning, but I, I want to be <laughs> aware of your time. Um, but anyhow, I will wrap it up, trust me. And your questions, if we don't have time for them, we'll stay a little bit later, but if we don't have time, we'll email you or something. So let's go through and we'll first talk about information governance. So basically it's a misunderstanding of the client's infrastructure. It's the failure of not getting into that and don't rely upon what the client says. Make sure you're talking to the IT. Um, you know, they really need to know what's going on, because they know where all the bodies are hidden, essentially. For identification, what happens here is oftentimes they miss the source of information, and they don't use the appropriate Rule 26 conferences. And you also need to define and narrow the scope. You don't want to, you, you have a broad preservation obligation, okay? But you don't have to collect everything. You know, lots of times you can do a targeted collection. You have to make preserve around it, but you don't have to collect everything. So, and then going into preservation and collection, failure to preserve is a problem. Um, if you're inconsistent on how you do it, if you don't track it, basically if you're not being a good custodian and monitoring the systems, uh, not a custodian, it's a bad word. If you're not a good supervisor. 
processing. This is when you get into keyword searching. You might, you know, use wild colors wrong, or you have this really complex search string. Um, I've got using CAR, again, sorry about the acronym, that's computer assisted review. It's also referred to as TAR, which is technology assisted review. Um, as I said, computers have problems with certain things. So, you know, you have to be careful because numbers don't really work very well with computer assisted review. If they're dealing with concepts. For productions, as I said, this is really when you're going through um, the whole process. This is really where a lot of things happen. I'm listing some of these right here. Um, that's what happened in the Wells Fargo case is that she essentially went through and didn't do a complete review of all our documents and then when they were produced they had a problem. So productions is kind of the hot point. And then finally in presentation sometimes the wrong document comes out. So the, uh, lots of times the judge will have a kill switch and they'll have to like turn it off. So it, uh, lots of times it is inadvertent disclosure of client information. And the worst thing of course that happens is nothing works. <laughs> Unfortunately, that happens a lot. So this is the electronic discovery reference model. Um, you have a heads up on some of the things that can happen during the whole process. So what can you do? Hey, you guys are awesome. You're attending a local CLE. Glad to have all you here. Read the blogs. Okay, and everyone is raving about Craig Ball's most recent thing on a preservation um, letter. Um, so go there. This is an old screenshot of it, but it's been updated. There's some other ones that I love. My friend Josh Gilman, he's an attorney as well as a tech. Um, also, if you have a certain uh, vendor that you're using for your review, make sure you get that. Again, I have a link here that shows the top ones. I just listed out some of my favorites. Uh, 10 conventions. Um, everyone has moved to online. And a lot of people are offering things online now. Um, so there's one coming up, it's called Relativity Fest. It is 100% free, a lot of really good information. Oh, and ILTACon too. And I don't remember exactly when that's coming up, but I think it's soon, like real soon. And find your resources. So really, folks, it really comes down to three choices at the end of the day. So when you're thinking about taking a case with these possibly thorny e-discovery issues, well, educate yourself now. Ask questions. Do this before you, before you take on those e-discovery tasks. Get that framework in your head. Kind of start reading the common things. Start reading the case law. Next thing you could do or option for you is to associate or consult with technical consultants, or perhaps a tech-savvy sa counsel that has gone through the e-discovery process. That's okay. You can't be an expert at everything. You need to have someone on your team that is, though. And finally, perhaps e-discovery is just not your deal right now, and that's fine, but you need to decline the representation. Don't be like that attorney who tries to bluff her way through that could be a problem. You don't want to lose your license. You know, maybe it's just not the right time. But as I said before, you all are so smart. You can figure this out. You do have an obligation of it. There's a lot of information out there. There's a lot of good people that can help you. Go to the EDRM. You know, Mary Mack is great. Kaylee Walstead is great. They are wonderful people. They love to educate people. So closing it up. Samuel Smiles, um, we've revised that at Shepherd Data. I think I do have time for a few questions. Uh, again, there's no stupid questions. We don't have to strike your questions. And that is my contact information. Um, and so I am going to turn to my colleagues. Laura, do you have some questions for me? Hi, Chris. Yes, I do. If you have an open case and opposing attorney asks you to tell your client to take down something she posted on Facebook, should you say you will not advise the client to take down because opposing counsel could then accuse her of spoliation of evidence? 
I would take down that. I would go to the judge on that one because that's a problem. Yeah, that is a problem. Anytime you're altering the Facebook page or anything else, that's a problem. Um, and I can, I can understand the conundrum. Um, maybe you need to come into some sort of agreement, like maybe it's something that's um, disclosing a secret or something like that. Um, it really depends. I don't know the context of the case, but um, I wouldn't immediately, uh, and, uh, and whoever asked the question is hesitating, I think that's right. You might need to get the judge involved on this one. Next question. Are there ethical obligations to produce native files or can we produce PDFs with a table of metadata for items like spreadsheets? Well, again, um, it's kind of a layered thing. It really depends on the case, um, on what you produce to the other side and what you agree upon. So you could conceivably produce PDFs because lots of times these cases are about the actual content and not about the metadata but it's a layered effect. So you need to preserve those original documents. So if there's something, some, sometimes some of these documents will start looking wonky, um, and then that's a heads up that something's wrong to you and opposing counsel. So you might have to take a look at the underlying metadata to see if there's an issue. And particularly spreadsheets, those do not translate well to, um, into um, PDF. You know, basically, you know, what will happen, they'll print and then you'll have like a thousand pages with one column that has one word in it for a thousand pages. <laughs> so, you know, some of those documents, you, you only can produce those in native format and you have to figure out how to redact the information and you have to go into agreement with opposing counsel. So, yes, you could produce some PDF, but you need to preserve the underlying data. And you need to have an agreement on how you're going to handle that information if they want to see that underlying data. Next question. I'm a solo practitioner. Can't I simply produce PDFs? And if not, how can I meet e-discovery obligations? Mm, well, no. <laughs> it, it depends. Yes, you can produce PDFs, but as we talked about that prior case, um, where she just produced PDFs, where she messed up. She didn't really mess up when she produced PDFs. I mean, that was the start of the inquiry. Really, the reason why she got into trouble is because it looked like she worked all this time. So they just asked to see the underlying documentation. She needed to keep that. So that's what you need to do. It's all about preservation and making sure that you're not trying to hide evidence. Next. With respect to clawback agreements, if counsel inadvertently includes privileged materials in their production and they don't issue a clawback, am I obligated to let them know that they produce privileged documents? In Minnesota, you are. There's actually an ethics opinion. I think it's 20 or 22. I can't remember. It's an ethics opinion that basically says if you inadvertently produce privileged information, you don't know it, the other side does. The other side does have an obligation to let you know. It's like, hey, uh, I don't think you meant to do this. Chris, there are no more questions. There's uh, no more? There are no more questions. Okay, cool. Uh, so if people do want to reach out and, and uh, have a question that they want to submit to us privately, that's fine. And you can reach Chris Chalstrom at cchalstrom at shepherddata.com. And you should still be able to see that email address and our general phone number on your screen. Well, it's nice to have you all see you. Well, I didn't see you. It was nice presenting in front of you. I really appreciate it. Again, thank you everyone who helped with this presentation. You guys have a great day and maybe I'll see you out there. Take care. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Thank you to Chris, Joy, and Laura from Shepherd Data. We appreciate Shepherd's support of the Bar Associations. Uh, to everyone attending, thank you for joining us. Uh, we hope you will join us for our final two presentations in Sponsor Week. Thank you. Have a great day.